Dear colleagues, let's move to point 10 of our agenda, appointment of a member of Executive Board European Central Bank. So I would like to welcome uh, the Irish Central Bank Governor, Philip Lane. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. As you know, the ECOFIN Council decided on 12 February to recommend uh, uh, Mr. Lane uh, for uh, Chief Economist, the member of the Executive Board uh, uh, of the ECB position, uh, replacing Mr. Pratt as of 1st June 2019 for a term of office of eight years. Um, colleague, no, and uh, that is not a secret that we had uh, the opportunity uh, to have an informal exchange of views with Mr. Lane in a previous uh, occasion uh, and that uh, this parliament uh, was extremely uh, very well uh, impressed by the qualification uh, of Mr. Lane so it's uh, for us and for me a pleasure that uh, you are now uh, you have been um, uh, recommended uh, um, by the ECOFIN uh, and uh, so uh, we are very glad to have the opportunity to have this uh, formal hearing uh, with you. Uh, I would uh, uh, give you, at this note, it is a consultation procedure as uh, for the uh, members of the executive board, and uh, we will proceed with uh, Mr. Lane's presentation first and then a question from members. Please, you have the floor. Good morning, Chairman, honorable members of the European Parliament, I'm pleased to have the opportunity this morning to appear before you, especially given the role of the European Parliament in holding the ECB to account, and in particular, your role in the process of appointing members to the Executive Board of the ECB. I will first uh, present my experience and, and motivation for going forward for this position, and then I'll turn to some of the policy and organizational issues facing the ECB. I've been Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland since late 2015. Before that, I was a Professor of Economics with a focus on financial globalization and European monetary integration. Given the nature of my work, the empirical and policy-focused nature of my work, uh, this has meant I've been collaborating and interacting with many policy organizations since the mid-1990s, uh, including the ECB since its inception, the European Commission, the IMF, the OECD, the Bank for International Settlements, and many other organizations. In 2001, I was honored to be the inaugural recipient of the Hermann Bernasser Prize for outstanding contributions to European monetary economics. The worldview under, underlying my career, both in academia and now in central banking, has been that a, a strong European Union is essential in managing financial and, and economic globalization. The framework of the EU has enabled member countries to obtain the benefits of the four freedoms, while also ensuring that the EU has a powerful and unified voice in the management of the global economic and financial system. In particular, monetary union has the potential to be a very effective mechanism to manage financial globalization. By sharing a common currency, foreign exchange shocks are less prevalent for members of the monetary union, Moreover, access to a common central bank provides an important buffer in managing liquidity shocks during crisis periods. By ruling out currency risk within the area and by ruling out disruptive currency uh, movements, monetary union also enables deeper forms of economic and financial union among the member countries. While the crisis certainly revealed important deficiencies in the initial institutional design, the underlying logic of economic and monetary union remains compelling. The post-crisis reforms have bolstered the resilience of EMU, even if there remain outstanding challenges. Accordingly, my conviction that EMU can provide a strong platform for stability and prosperity across Europe has determined my career path, including the transition to central banking in 2015, and now the recommendation to the European Council to join the executive board of the ECB. Let me turn now to some policy and organizational issues. The primary mandate of the ECP is to provide, deliver price stability for the euro area. 
While the ECB was broadly successful in achieving the same until the crisis, the pursuit of, its, of this mandate in recent years has required unconventional measures. In my assessment, the ECB strategy uh, we've adopted in recent years has provided the monetary accommodation required to support economic recovery, maintain inflation expectations, eliminate deflation risk, and over time ensure that inflation is on a path of sustained convergence to the target. Importantly, the data-dependent nature of the strategy provides the flexibility to adjust to changes in the macro-financial environment. Since late 2015, I've been actively involved in these policy decisions. The blend of empirical analysis and economic modeling that are necessary to evaluate the different policy options has enabled the Governing Council to make its decisions in a rigorous data-driven manner that is also well understood by market participants. My experience and training in quantitative macroeconomics have enabled me to be an active contributor in this process. Let me turn to the, uh, the role of the ECB in financial stability. It has an essential role both in terms of mitigating risks and in relation to crisis management in the event of instability. It, in terms of risk surveillance, uh, its financial stability report plays a central role, while its top of macroprudential powers are potentially important. With the macroprudential forum of the ECB and the macroprudential bulletin, important mechanisms to promote best practices among national macroprudential authorities. Um, also through its cooperation with other institutions, above all with the ESRB, it plays a central role in coordinating uh, macroprudential policy across Europe. I've been active in this work as the current chair of the Advisory Technical Committee and former chair of the Advisory Scientific Committee of the ESRB. I've also led or co-led three special projects for the ESRB, the recent high-level task force on safe assets, the 2016 report on low interest rates, and also the 2016 report on the uh, transition to a low carbon economy. Now, in my current role in the Central Bank of Ireland, since we are the national macroprudential authority, I've had a lead responsibility in uh, macroprudential policies such as the counter cyclical capital buffer, the OC buffer, and borrower based measures such as loan to value and loan to income ceilings. More generally, the fact that my academic career has focused on cross-border financial flows means that I have a particular expertise in, in this area. Uh, the role of the, uh, if I turn to supervision for a minute, uh, the role of the SSM to me has been uh, very important in delivering a level playing field across the banking union and ensuring that supervisory decision making is insulated from national political pressures. Uh, it's appropriate that the supervisory work is separated from the central banking functions of the ECB, uh, but with the necessary interactions between these functions taking place through highly structured mechanisms. Uh, in my view, uh, this area is going to continue to evolve, um, and uh, as the whole uh, configuration behind banking union, between the SSM, the Re Resolution Recovery Directive, the Resolution Board, and so on, uh, we will see a continuing evolution, which inclu should include, over time, the phased introduction of EDIS. Uh, since we are also the National Resolution Authority and responsible for the National Deposit Insurance System, I've had direct experience in overseeing the implementation of these measures in recent years. Uh, if I go beyond banking union, uh, I also consider capital markets union to be an important ingredient in building a, a more efficient, more stable European financial system, where, where the key to capital markets union is through building up, especially equity markets, enabling a higher degree of cross-border risk sharing across, uh, across the borders. If I turn to the underlying uh, fiscal requirements, it's clear that uh, the stability of the euro area requires a commitment to fiscal sustainability by each participating country. In particular, in good years, uh, member countries should improve their fiscal balance sheets. In turn, this will allow the use of fiscal policy during downturns. Uh, and through that counter-cyclical mechanism, uh, this again should improve the resilience of the euro area. It should also be recognized that 
structural policies that, that improve the flexibility of the economies of member countries can also help improve the management of cyclical shocks. If we think about going beyond national fiscal policy, uh, it's clear that pooled fiscal resources or cross-country insurance mechanisms, such as the reinsurance of national unemployment systems, can provide additional instruments to address asymmetric shocks. In addition, a common fiscal response can prove helpful in responding to large common shocks, such as a global recession. So to me, uh, the Euro Area Stabilization Function uh, is an important uh, objective to reach. Um, and of course, I think it, there's an important uh, linked um, initiative currently in terms of the budgetary instrument for convergence and competitiveness. Now, of course, this is uh, for those involved in, uh, uh, in the other institutions and the member countries to decide the future fiscal policy, but the ECB's uh, work is clearly eased uh, by, by progress in this broader institutional framework. And then finally, if I turn to the organization of the ECB, I think it's important that members of the executive board are energetic and committed to making sure the ECB operates with maximum efficiency. Uh, the ECB should be a progressive, diverse, and transparent central bank that, that is accountable to its stakeholders and provides a fulfilling workplace for its staff members. This relates to my leadership at the Central Bank of Ireland. Uh, last, uh, recently, we were honoured to receive the Transparency Award from centralbanking.com uh, in recognition of our pro-transparency agenda in terms of publishing the minutes of our board meetings, uh, releasing as much information as we can through our website, and building up our outreach and communication programs. Uh, we've also been a leader in promoting diversity, uh, both in terms of our own organization, but also in terms of the governance of the financial firms that we regulate. We also uh, commit to our staff in terms of an extensive learning and development program. So I would hope to carry over uh, these, uh, this organizational outlook to the ECB. Uh, through uh, my work at the Executive Board in improving the standing of the ECB among external stakeholders and vis vis its staff members. So I hope this introduction can uh, convey to you that I believe that my experience can be of value to the ECB's Executive Board and I'd be honoured to receive your support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lane, for your very, very interesting Presentation now. Uh, first speaker is Markus Felber. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lane. It's a pleasure having you here, and uh, hopefully, as you are the only candidate, uh, we've got presented even before uh, we can organise a good cooperation between you and our committee. Um, as uh, you spoke already about, but I want to go a little bit more in the depth. Is the question how the instruments um, European Central Bank has available? Um, are already fully used or what uh, instruments you see as we have some shadows in economical terms, uh, some member states in the Eurozone already having passed to recession and in the circumstances around us uh, I don't see huge growth potential as we are prepared for the moment or preparing a uh, trade fight with the United States and, and other battlefields around that. So what instruments you see as we have already zero interest rates and uh, quantitative easing, what additional instruments you see? And a second question, I want to get a, a personal remark from you on the IMF proposal. Uh, to make uh, cash uh, uh, with uh, neg uh, to, to bring negative interest rates to cash, which was uh, surprisingly for me how that could work. You have an idea or an opinion on that uh, because that's seen by IMF as the last tool uh, or instruments uh, to be available, and therefore I want to get some estimation from your side. Thank you very much. Let me divide uh, your question into two parts. One is um, how should we think about the ECB response to near-term uh, negative news? So what we're seeing at the moment is really a uh, combination of two factors. One is the European labor market remains strong. We've seen unemployment come down a lot. 
uh, we've seen in those, especially those labour markets where unemployment is lower than elsewhere, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, upward wage pressures. So if you like, uh, we remain confident that the underlying mechanisms that would lead to improving inflation performance over time are still active. On the other hand, as you indicated, it's also clear uh, from many surveys that there's been a sequence of negative shocks in recent times. Um, but I think it's also uh, fair to say is all of this in the, is in the neighborhood of uh, reasonably small adjustments to the forecast. That, you know, I think um, uh, the current strategy can cater to uh, limited downside revisions. So by that I mean the current strategy, remember, uh, has a, a lot of forward guidance in it. So as you say, when the interest rate, the, the kind of policy rate on deposits is at minus 40 basis points. But of course, when we think about the interest rates that are relevant to the economy, which may be the five-year rate, the 10-year rate, that's basically not just today's policy rate, but the expect, expected path for policy rates for the next five to 10 years. Well, there's a connection because the foundation for the long-term rate is what the market believes will be the policy rate, not just today, but next year, the year after, the year after that. Plus other factors, there's certainly other factors in play. So in terms of, uh, this is why we uh, have a, a big part of the current policy package is what we call forward guidance. Um, that currently the indication is uh, that the uh, where, you know, since last summer, the indication has been uh, no rate increase will be envisaged until after the summer, and even then, it depends on the data. So th that forward guidance can accommodate uh, revisions to, to uh, projections, because clearly, I mean, the market is expecting, uh, if you look at what's happening to rates into the future, the market is expecting uh, the, the downward revisions in data to mean a slower path of normalization. So the current strategy can deal with that. Now, if you had a bigger shock or more persistent shock, so unemployment started to go up again and inflation started not just to go more slowly but actually to go into reverse. The current strategy has also indicated that uh, above all else, we are committed to reaching the target over the medium term. And, um, Although uh, we've deployed uh, certain instruments, uh, it's not, you know, I don't think it's, it's anywhere near the case that the ECB has uh, hit all limits. So I, I would disagree with you that uh, uh, we are at the irretrievable uh, lower bound. Uh, but I also think it's a good idea not to be overly specific about what combination of instruments will be used until uh, you are at that point, because there are tactical issues there. Now, there's a longer-term issue, which you indicated, about, and this, uh, the reference you made to negative interest rates on cash. Um, I think um, that should be viewed not as something immediate, but if you are forward-looking over not just the next decade, but uh, the next several decades, this issue about what's going to be the role of cash in the future, and especially if cash is becoming electro mostly electronic uh, on um, uh, where physical cash becomes less, I think, I'm guessing this is where the IMF view is coming from, is um, as more and more of money is held in electronic forms, it will be technically possible to, to um, uh, impose negative interest rates or taxes on, on, on uh, cash equivalents. So, so that, that is true. I mean, I think that, uh, many people uh, will say this is going to be uh, part of the future. How relevant it is for the near term, I'm not so sure. Uh, because the, it's not the case that cash is disappearing very quickly. Um, so let's see about that, but I would view that as kind of, um, it's appropriate that we have a research effort uh, looking to the far future, but it's not for the, it's not for the immediate term. Thank you. Pervanj uh, Beres. Monsieur le candidat, je vais vous demander Mr. Candidate. Je vous demander une réponse par oui. I'd like a yes or no answer on this, please. Okay. 
peux remettre le compteur à zéro, s'il vous plaît Can you reset it to zero, please Je vais vous demander une réponse par... I wanted to ask for a yes or no answer on this one, please. Do you attach importance to the monetary dialogue between the European Central Bank and the European Parliament? Yes. Okay. Then, uh, in the written question you received, uh, there was the question that the SND group has introduced that says, will you accept your appointment to the ECB Executive Board if the European Parliament were to vote against it? And your answer is, I'm honored to be nominated by my government and recommended by the European Council, by the Economic and Financial uh, Affairs Council. I'm sincerely hopeful that the European Parliament will also deliver a favorable opinion on the Council recommendation. Est-ce que vous pensez que c'est une réponse Do you think that is a correct answer uh, Yes, I mean, I think, uh, as, as was indicated by the Chair, it's clear what the role of the ECB is in the, in the appointment process, which is different to the monetary dialogue. So, uh, you know, I think um, I will live with the rules, uh, I obviously live with the rules as set out about how appointments are made, but let me, you know, emphasize this, because I do follow the monetary dialogue even now, and especially when I was also as a professor, it is a very effective way uh, to hear alternative views, because the papers that you commission, uh, you usually get very good consultative papers, which I read uh, from a range of uh, think tanks and academics. Uh, and, uh, does, you know, compared to the press conference where you get journalists asking questions of the president, the more searching uh, dialogue here is important, uh, I think, in holding the ECB to account. So I think it, it is very important. Um, uh, the dialogue is extremely important. Uh, I think it's already uh, very important, and uh, I'm sure that's going to be true into the future. Uh, but on the appointment process, uh, you know, it, it would be inappropriate for me to uh, uh, comment or innovate on, on the laid out appointment process. So, uh, you think that the monetary dialogue is, in, is important, uh, uh, and I think that it adds but you wouldn't mind being a member of the central bank against the opinion of the parliament. I mean, but we're not academics. We're not just here to um, uh, boost the dialogue. There is a reality and uh, the rule of law. And I think that is important. If you look at the situation of uh, the central bank compared to the Fed, well, if the Congress is against a nomination, then it wouldn't be possible. Uh, do you not think uh, that you, well, if you think that monetary dialogue is important, then you should ask uh, the Council to take account of uh, the Parliament's opinion? So, I think uh, for anyone going for the Executive Board, you know, I think uh, it it's, would be very welcome to receive the endorsement of, of this committee and the European Parliament in general. Uh, it's also the case that we are not politicians, um, and I don't think, um, you know, I think the design of the nomination process is, is the, should be determined by the political system, not by us. And the design of the nomination process um, has a certain uh, allocation responsibilities now, and it is not for me uh, to, to, to make any innovation to that. Um, of course, in the US, it's a different system where the, where the Senate confirmation is, is necessary. Uh, but, I mean, I think, of course, it, it's very important, uh, the view of the European Parliament. Um, and the, the view of the European Parliament, of course, will be considered by the European Council. Uh, so, I, you know, the, the fact that you, you have this um, um, uh, advisory role, it, I think, uh, gives you a lot of influence um, at the European Council. Thank you. Uh, for the ECR group, Ralph Packett. Uh, thank you. To be a bit more concrete, if the Eurozone would um, enter a recession before the ECB is able to raise the rates, would you consider a negative interest 
rates and what is then exactly the impact on this, on the availability of the existence of, of cash? Uh, and second question, do you think monetary policy can create sustainable growth and jobs and is that within the responsibility of the ECB? Thank you. So, as you know, uh, the currently the deposit rate is negative at minus 40 basis points. Um, I, I think any uh, assessment of the combination of the policy rate, uh, purchase programs, other ways to influence the, the inf path for interest rates, uh, and then, uh, very importantly, the forward guidance. Because to recall what I said earlier on, uh, when we think about a mortgage or a medium-term loan to a company, what matters is not just today's policy rate, but the expected path of policy rates into the future. Uh, and so this is why there's so much emphasis on uh, communicating not just about today, but into the future. So I think uh, what the ECB has been doing is to use each of those instruments in combination. Uh, so I think uh, famously with negative interest rates, the trade-off is uh, the, the possibility that if you send them too negative, it could harm the banking sector. And of course, uh, that would have to be assessed about how deeply negative uh, interest rate could go. Coming back to cash, uh, since uh, the, the you know, mechanism currently is cash, of course, uh, you know, pay, pays a zero interest rate, which is above negative. So if you go too negative, the fear is uh, people who have a lot of uh, resources may just build, uh, have warehouses full of cash. But I think uh, that risk can be, can be uh, managed uh, in, in different ways. Um, so I, cash, you know, and into the future, as there's less cash held, that, that becomes less of an issue. So I think it's important to emphasize is all of this is in response to the conditions we face. And if we have conditions where economic performance is weak and inflationary pressure is weak, we do have to respond. Because I do think uh, it's, it's vitally important and all of the strategy of the ECB is to emphasize is that it's very important to be clear that we maintain our medium term target. And that lies behind uh, all of these measures. Um, in terms of the longer term, in one of the written answers, I communicate that, of course, uh, in the longer term, uh, what's going to drive prosperity is productivity, investment, education, uh, good institutions. Monetary policy can disrupt that. If we run a bad monetary policy, it can create volatility and uncertainty. But a well-run uh, monetary policy should mean that in the long run, these other policies are far more important and monetary policies in the background. We can cause damage, but in the long term, I think it's really just to be st a stabilizing factor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Calvet-Chambon. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Laconicamente, señor gobernador... Thank you. Uh, just a, a few words. Um, I uh, think uh, that we all know that you're very highly qualified for this position and uh, that this is a, a strategic post and uh, which uh, provides uh, support. So I have four questions for you. First of all, after, so many, after four years of crisis, what do you think then, uh, what can you do to uh, strengthen the euro before the next crisis. Every day counts. Now, do you think then that we've taken enough measures to reduce the fragility of the euro? Secondly, what do you think of the non-conventional measures that have been applied? Now, surprisingly, we've seen a study that says that there's no repercussions on the exit of the crisis. Now, we're also surprised about the Dutch study I'd like your opinion on that. Thirdly, now, we heard you talk about the SSBBS. Do you think that is the asset that uh, every single currency needs to be strong on the market? Fourthly, I apologies for the impertinence. What does the central bank think about social dumping that 
your country now is going to abandon then? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Um, on, on the architecture question, uh, let me emphasize that a lot has been done. So the creation of uh, the supervisory mechanism, uh, the creation of the resolution mechanism, uh, the uh, creation of the ESM, uh, the, uh, all of these factors provide more resilience in the event of a crisis. Uh, let me emphasize two other factors. One is uh, making sure that fiscal policies are in good shape. Because, I mean, I think I would also emphasize here a lot of progress has been made. So even now, um, the fact that the, by and large, uh, there's been a, a fair degree of fiscal discipline in Europe over the last decade means that uh, compared to five or six years ago, Europe is uh, readier to face a downturn than it was five or six years ago. Uh, let me also emphasize, as I indicated, that there, there is value in, in building some common fiscal instruments I think especially in the event of a very large shock. Uh, and, but let me emphasize again, this is not what we're seeing. Uh, what we have now is a Europe which has fewer imbalances than before. We don't have the credit boom we saw in the mid-2000s. Uh, we, we don't have the large uh, external imbalances, the current account deficits and surpluses we saw. So it is not the case right now that Europe is in a super fragile situation um, I would say uh, we should continue to make progress. I do think it's important, um, as has been happening in recent years um, uh, in various countries, to reduce non-performing loans in banks. That's a vulnerability. Uh, I do think it's important that we ultimately get to a common deposit insurance system. Um, but I, I would emphasize is compared to where we were, uh, there's a lot of progress has been made. On unconventional policies, I think uh, so far the uh, verdict has to be extremely positive. That the fact that um, it really in the European context since summer 2014, uh, the move towards asset purchases, the move to negative interest rates, the um, adoption of forward guidance have all been very helpful. We have had very accommodative monetary conditions in Europe for five years. Uh, that has allowed interest rates to be and credit conditions to improve a lot. It's until uh, recent months, it's led to a significant recovery, which has been across Europe, in, uh, been a very widely shared recovery. So I do think um, it's been quite successful. Uh, in terms of the future, I do think, um, the, you know, both here and in the US and elsewhere, the kind of exit strategy, the how quickly balance sheets can be reduced, is, is going to be um, a kind of search process. On the importance of a single uh, euro bond type idea, there are different routes to go. The virtue of the sovereign bond backed security is, or the property of the sovereign bond backed security, is its design does not require any mutualization. This goes back to the political decisions of the European system. With mutualization, uh, for example, by giving the ECM more capital, uh, other possibilities are there. But if the desire is to have a, 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 a common bond without mutualization, the sovereign bond-backed security mechanism uh, can deliver, uh, you know, I think, progress. On the uh, social dumping question, I. Uh, infer from that you're asking about corp corporation tax. Uh, and there, and I, again, I, I talk about it in my written answer, is uh, this is a, a global issue. Uh, it's a European issue, uh, but it cuts across uh, currency systems. It's, it's the, comp the kind of role of uh, superstar firms who are able to um, engineer their balance sheets across the world requires an EU response, it requires a global response. Um, but clearly, because of the trade-offs and tensions here, this is for uh, p uh, political systems to sort out. Thank you. Ernest Urtasun. Thank you, Governor. Um, uh, we followed with a great interest a recent lecture you made in the uh, uh, um, National University of Ireland in Galway about financial instability related to climate change. 
Um, there, um, you said that central banks have a leadership role in ensuring that climate change is a strategic priority for the financial system as a whole. Um, and I would like to know um, your opinion on how the ECB should exactly align its goals uh, to the commitment of the Climate uh, uh, Change Treaty of Paris. Because in the past, we have had uh, several concerns, for instance, on the asset purchase programs, and particularly on the um, corporate uh, asset purchase programs of the ECB buying carbon assets. Uh, and I would like to know whether we can count on your commitment uh, uh, to fully align the ECB policies with the with with Climate Change uh, Treaty of Paris, and if that would entail uh, ending uh, buying uh, uh, carbon assets. And in general, I would like to know your views more broadly about this issue, about how monetary policy should uh, help fighting climate change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and thank you for your interest in my uh, speech. Uh, let me emphasize, is that uh, in common with many areas of policy making, uh, this issue of climate change is going to be the forefront for the ECB. Um, you know, this term is for eight years, and for this is in terms of the planning horizons for t decarbonizing the economy, that's a significant period. Um, I will come back to monetary policy, uh, but let me emphasize the two other areas where the ECB is going to be involved. Uh, one is financial stability policy, because clearly uh, the risks here in terms of uh, uh, financial instability from losses on uh, carbon-related assets or from a badly handled transition policy are there. Uh, and this, the ECB has to be involved in, given its uh, macroprudential role. Um, and so this is where issues such as uh, stress testing, um, going further in terms of understanding true disclosure and taxonomy, you know, the, the current agenda, uh, really understanding what are the carbon risks facing the EU area economy, I think it's going to be important. So there's a lot of work on uh, financial stability. Uh, there's going to be a lot of work for supervisors. So the SSM is going to be working hard as well in terms of the guidance it needs to give to banks, in terms of credit risk assessment and so on. Uh, for monetary policy, uh, may, let me make uh, two different remarks. One is already uh, weather shocks are a lot of the volatility we see. So even today, uh, we are already, um, uh, given what's going on in terms of the disruption to production associated with summers that are too hot, winters that are too wet, and so on, that's also already part of our daily life. Uh, and I think uh, we, uh, this is going to be important. We will have to become um, uh, much more expert in understanding the physical and economic effects of weather events, because that's a big part of, of, of the cycle we see. Then when you come to the execution of monetary policy here, I, I think this is really, um, as of today, I don't think we can, I can make a conclusive statement because there's a lot of work going on now to think about this. Uh, you may have noticed the recent uh, Bruegel paper um, on greening monetary policy. And the way actually I read that paper is in fact, today uh, monetary policy is not central. Because the, you know, the green bond universe, although it's growing quite rapidly, is not big enough. And the, the, ex the calculations in the Bruegel paper is that even if you had a, a kind of low carbon preference, say in a, in a bond purchase program, the, the effect on the financing costs is tiny. It's like four basis points, I think, is the effect. So I think it's, to be honest, it's for now a uh, sideshow. It's a second order issue. Compared to the uh, financial stability issue, the supervision issue. Um, but I think uh, for the future, let's see. I mean, so I think it's going to be, you will have seen uh, Benoit Couré give an, an interesting speech a few months ago. There's a lot of people working on this. Um, um, and so I think let's see into the future. Thank you. Um, I don't see speakers of the other group, so we move to Catch the Eye, Werner Langen. Yeah, vielen Dank. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, your um, uh, qualities uh, professionally uh, can't be uh, called into question. 
and uh, you this is all part of the uh, process and uh, the written uh, response uh, to the question from uh, uh, Mrs. Beres I think uh, was uh, sensible but I don't understand your reluctance at the moment now I do think that a member of uh, 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 the the uh, European uh, Centre Bank uh, that insists on independency uh, has to accept democratic structures. And I cannot imagine that uh, the future uh, uh, president uh, uh, would uh, take up office in light of a negative vote. And that uh, would go to you as well as a member of the executive board. That's not something that the parliament can accept. I think uh, in the uh, in next uh, mandate, we're going to have to come up with an agreement, an institutional agreement uh, with the council, as uh, was done 15 years ago with uh, uh, Mr. Peroso. Before his election, he said that every commissioner that gets a negative vote uh, from uh, the, uh, the uh, parliament with qualified members has to uh, step down. And I think in terms of the independency of uh, the uh, uh, European Central Bank, it's important to have a positive vote uh, from the parliament. And that's something you should work towards and not, and not say it, it doesn't really matter. The other institutions have proposed me. It doesn't really matter what happens. I'll get the office anyway. And so uh, I would ask you to give us a very clear statement about that. Thank you. Uh, just a point, no, because of course you made a question to Ms. Elena, and I, but, but from an institutional point of view, because I have very much sympathy with what you say, but of course the interlocutors for this is the European Council, so we have the, the recommendation uh, of the ECOFIN, and then we will have the recommendation of the Parliament to the European Council, which has to make a decision. So, of course, it's not a problem of the person. It's a problem of whether this body should, as I think, of course, in the treaty it says differently. So we have this small problem that the treaty says is a consultation, so it's not binding. Otherwise, it would have been consent. But, um, of course, we should address the European Council and tell them how you consider our recommendation politically, especially when we go to the president. Uh, that, so, but that's... Uh, just to put uh, your, your question that, in any case, deserves an answer to, to what I think institutionally is, is the appropriate track. So, I mean, I, I'm going to disagree with you that um, if you think I'm indifferent, if you think I think your opinion is unimportant, that's very far from the case. You know, um, as I indicated in my written answer, you know, I would hope to receive your approval. Um, and I think that is a part of the decision-making process, which in the end is with the European Council for the final decision. Uh, so in no way am I indifferent uh, to your opinion, uh, not, not at all. Uh, but equally, it is not for me to make the decision about how this uh, appointment is made. Uh, I, I think th that that is for, for the European institutions to decide uh, the process, uh, not, not for a candidate. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, I think we can uh, conclude here, and uh, thank you, Mr. Lane, for a uh, very interesting exchange of views, uh, and uh, in any case, we hope that the opinion will be positive, so this debate will be <laughs> concluded, but thank you.